Uh, hello everybody. I'm delighted to see so many of you, particularly on such a hot evening, so thank you for turning out. I'm also delighted to be able to do this talk for trade because the Crafts Council wholly supports the values and ambitions of trade. I personally support them and indeed many of the carrier bags that enter my house with my teenagers seem to come from trade, so we have quite a lot I think we're doing to support you. What I'd like to do is tell you a bit about the Crafts Council, a bit about the research work we've been doing around education and training, why we've been doing it, what some of the findings are, what we're doing with that as well, and the advocacy work we're doing. So then move on to tell you a bit about the manifesto, but also some of the research work, some of the makers we work with that espouse the values of what trade's trying to achieve. So that's what I want to do. I want it to be relaxed, so if you've got a question, don't hesitate to ask me and interrupt. Um, I may ask you some questions at different points as we go along, and of course there will be a Q&A at the end, so that's the plan. So, a few words about the Crafts Council to start with. Who are we? Well, we're a national development agency for craft. We host the National Contemporary Craft Collection, we host and curate a number of exhibitions, both uh, long-standing ones and touring exhibitions. We run participation and education programmes, some of them also supporting professional development and stimulating markets, whether in this country or internationally. We showcase work and makers work internationally, so Miami, Basel, the States, South Korea, we've been to a number of places to showcase markets and of course Europe. We stimulate innovation in different ways, craft skills in the more traditional sense that you might recognise, working with familiar materials like wood, metal, leather, textiles, but we also work with makers who work across the craft economy, so innovation, working with industrialists or engineers who might be applying craft skills to use materials knowledge to develop, for example, healthcare innovations. Lauren Boker is a innovator who's developed with her textiles knowledge, I keep looking at my wrist, but a, a um, bandage that changes colour as the wound heals. So we look at those kind of innovations as well. We do quite a bit of research and we publish Crafts magazine as well, which you may be familiar with. So what about craft itself? A little bit about craft in the UK. Anyone got any ideas roughly how much craft might contribute to the UK economy? And Guy here is not allowed to answer because he definitely knows or should know. Any ideas? Millions, billions? Um, yeah? About 85. 85 million. 85 million? Good, good figure because I think there's a lot of... There's, there's, different parts of craft where maybe the more traditional craft is probably somewhere around that figure. But if you look at craft as a whole across the UK economy, 3.4 billion is what we find it contributes. So that's made up through the craft sector directly, through the wider creative industry, so craft in, for example, film, Harry Potter, the wands, things like that. Um, craft also in the wider, what we call the craft economy, so those kind of innovations I was talking about. 44,000 makers, 150,000 craft businesses. And if you look more widely at making, some of you may be familiar with the work of Here East, who look at making not just in a craft sense, but in wider making across the economy. They think that they got Deloitte to do some work and they think there's a contribution across the craft economy of something like 15.5 billion, including the supply chains where makers contribute to. So in addition to the value of craft to the economy, obviously lots of people participate in craft for pleasure, for leisure, for just learning a new skill. And what we find is that there's 19,000 people each year contribute or participate in some way in craft. There's 5.6 million craft items purchased every year. And of those businesses, there's 88,000 makers who run their own businesses who are sole traders. So there's a few numbers for you about what we know about the craft sector. Now, with that interest in craft, and I think you're probably here, you know that there's a kind of increase in interest in the handmade, 
the handcrafted, the authentic. Come and have a seat, please. There's some seats down here and in the middle. The contemporary and the creative economies are experiencing a huge boom in uh, interest in craft, in, in, in how we experience craft. So this raises new questions for me about how we learn about craft, how we learn new skills. And the conditions for craft and the continued growth of interest in craft appear to be strong. So that would make you think that, well, there must be lots of opportunities out there, lots of places like the Good Life Centre running classes, running courses. There must be a boom in craft education, mustn't there? However, what we found was we were experiencing lots of different anecdotes that were telling us that this isn't the case. So we were hearing, for example, in schools that craft courses were reducing, you were hearing the same thing. We were hearing students in universities saying that craft was starting to decline, that courses were closing. So we wanted to look at those anecdotal skills, we started talking to people more. I went out into some universities, some higher education institutions and started talking to people and discovered some really interesting things that the haptic skills, those skills of touch that we rely on for making. In some cases, people were feeling starting to disappear. So I heard a really interesting story about, I think it's the University of Lincoln has a surgery course. So training surgeons to work in the medical profession. What they were finding was that surgeons no longer had the hand skills as acutely that they needed for surgery. So even if you're doing pinhole surgery and microsurgery, you still need to have that sense of touch and feel. So what are they doing? They're introducing those medical students to clay, to get them to work with clay, to actually strengthen those hand skills. I found, um, I do ceramics in my spare time, talking to people, I was finding that if you're doing a degree in ceramics, and you're lucky these days if you can find a ceramics course to do a degree, but if you have a ceramics element, sometimes people aren't learning the technical skills anymore. So you build a piece of, of, of craft, you build a, a piece of pottery, you build something that you want to fire. People weren't learning the firing skills, the, me the, the, the making of, of the glazes, the temperatures, things like that. So again, part of the skill. And then what struck me most vividly was talking to people about textiles courses. Textiles courses where some young people were coming to do a textiles degree never having used a sewing machine, which I found quite shocking. I mean, I, how, many of you, how many of you can use a sewing machine? Just a straw poll, so uh, the vast majority of you, you know how to use them. For me, I grew up using a sewing machine. In fact, when I was a teenager, my best friend and I, when we went out in an evening and we wanted something new to wear, we would go out and buy some fabric and hastily spend the whole afternoon trying to make something. Go out in the evening with the thread still hanging down, the bits we'd fudged and hadn't quite finished, and then insist to people that, no, no, we bought it in a shop, and, which is kind of sad in a way, isn't it? It's like, why didn't we own it that we'd made it? But no, no, we had to have bought it in a shop. So. That made me think as well about my kids. My daughter sews, I tried to get my son to, to, to use the sewing machine, not interested. My dad used to use our old Singer sewing machine at home though, because he, he was an engineer. So if he wanted to make something with a bit of leather to use as a part of something he was building, he'd use the sewing machine. So what's happening to those skills? Um, well, as a research manager, I was concerned that we, needed some proper evidence, we needed a robust evidence base. It was all very well, these anecdotes, but what did we really find out? What could we find out? So in 2013, we decided to commission a new research project to look at formal craft skills. The reason we picked formal craft skills was because you can get data on who's participating, how many courses there are from the Department for Education, from the higher education bodies. So we thought, let's get some research across from GCSE at Key Stage 4 upwards through further education, higher education, apprenticeships, further, edu and, uh, further and higher education, to see what we could find out about trends across several years. So what we did was we looked at data that showed us, no, I'll change that actually. I'll talk about our objective, because why are we putting this together? We weren't just going to put it together 
to find out about those trends. What we wanted to do was work, for example, with organisations like Trade to do some advocacy work, to contribute to the debate about what was happening about our education system, what was happening about creative education and what was specifically happening about craft-related education and training. So we've now conducted the research three times. We first published in 2013 and we've got data now going back to 2007-8. So what I want to do is give you a flavour of the first and second iterations findings. We've also just got the data through for the third research project and we're going to launch that in October. So I can give you a bit of a sneak preview of those findings. And what we're discovering is, I'm going to skip one or two slides here. Um, these are overall findings, but they're a little hard to see because they're so small. But what we started to look at was GCSE and Key Stage 4 students. What was happening about the participation of students and how many were participating from 2007-8? And what we discovered in five years, something quite shocking, the participation had dropped 25% in craft-related GCSEs and related exams. So when I'm sort of talking about craft-related, I'm talking principally about art and design, design and technology. So a quarter drop. We're waiting to find out about the next data coming up to 13-14, and I suspect it will have fallen further. Further education participation fall in the same period by 40%. And then if we look at higher education, the number of courses offered in higher education, and this is where it really gets scary, in the same time period, dropped, sorry, seven years, dropped 50%. So the actual number of courses you can do in higher education, whether that's foundation degrees, B uh, sorry, HNCs, HNDs, and first degrees, 50% reduction, which I think is quite scary. Um, some of the good news in that is that there's a sense of widening participation. So for organisations like trade, and many of you who might be supporting people to engage in mending, to engage in understanding how can you do simple repairs on your own clothes or on other clothes you want to sell. There's an increase in entry level courses. So entry level, level one and level two are increasing, which is good news. But for us, what concerns us is that we also want to see the opportunities for people who want to progress into making as a career. There isn't that progression. So you're losing the level three and level four courses, you're losing the further and higher education courses. So where are we going to find our makers of the future if we don't have that kind of throughput of people coming through from schools? So um, this has all been quite worrying. So why do you think this is happening? We've got a decline in that formal education, which to me points to a decline at key stages one to three. So kids going into primary school must be doing craft type making less. And one of the reasons we think that is happening, that reduction in choice, is the introduction of the English baccalaureate. I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but it's a government performance framework which judges schools by the number of GCSEs at A star to C that young people achieve in a selected number of subjects. So the EBAC, the English Baccalaureate subjects, have five pillars to them. So you have to pick sciences, English, maths. If you're doing two English and three science, you've already got several subjects. You have to choose a language and you have to choose a humanity, so geography or history. So then the room for manoeuvre to do a creative subject is much reduced. Now some schools, fortunately, are saying young people should choose what they want. They should choose across the spectrum and choose several art and design, design and technology subjects if they choose. But other schools are pressurising young people because they know they're going to be judged in the performance framework by these outcomes. So there's a real kind of 
move to encourage young people to go into more traditionally analytical subjects. Other organisations are building the same picture, and there's a kind of growing consensus around this, whether it's the Cultural Learning Alliance, um, representing a range of organisations, the National Society for Education in Art and Design, who represent teachers, where teachers are also saying, and there's probably some of you in the room experiencing this, that the hours for teaching are cutting down, the continuing professional development is cutting down, and also things like the messy space. You know, you need to be able to make a, uh, make a mess if you're going to cut lots of things up, if you're going to do a bit of woodwork, if you're going to do things that need clearing up afterwards. You can't just use a regular classroom, so there's a physical space issue as well. And even though lots of courses, like in this centre, are running that help you to gain those skills at different points in your life, if you can't have access to those skills in your education where everybody gets access, then we're failing our young people, I think, in not giving them that opportunity to be creative. So other organisations like Nesta, the innovation charity, are calling on the government to challenge what, the way this is happening because they talk about how the way in which young people combine a creative subject with a science subject is actually leading people to be more employable. If you combine those different types of subjects, then you have a set of problem-solving skills, a way of looking at challenges that is actually more employable than if you specialise in one, one direction. So Nesta were supporting what we do. They're also talking about the Russell Group of Universities who specify what are called facilitating subjects. So they advise young people going to university about a set of subjects that are more likely to be attractive to the Russell Group, the more elite universities. Let's stop for a moment. And even though that's only advisory, to be fair, nevertheless, that bears down on schools and how careers advice and guidance in informs young people's choices how the prestigious universities are seen and so on. So we've got a number of factors contributing towards this scenario where young people are taking fewer creative subjects. So following these reports that we produced, following the research that we did, and we've now got this evidence base, one of the things we wanted to do, there's some more seats down here if you'd like. Do join us. Come and have a seat here. What we wanted to do was begin a conversation about these findings. So we took our reports out and our findings to a whole series of meetings, a whole series of focus groups with makers, with educators, with gallerists, with careers people, with trade unions, with industrialists and entrepreneurs to generate a conversation about well, what should we do about this situation. And the, gradually some momentum gathered and we decided that we would have a manifesto for craft education and training. Some calls for action and we pieced together a manifesto, we consulted on it and then we got quite a lot of support to launch it in the House of Commons. So we had a nice formal launch in the House of Commons, with, that's Edmund de Waal, the ceramicist who launched it for, for us alongside a couple of MPs, some apprentices and some young people. We had a broad coalition of interest. What was absolutely fantastic about that day is this artwork, this green and a lot of the artwork in the manifesto itself was designed by the designer Anthony Burrell and his screen, print, uh, screen printers. And on the day we launched the manifesto, we decided we were going to take screen pre printing equipment into the House of Commons. So we were a little bit worried about this because there's all the airport security and stuff like that, but they were absolutely fine with it. So when we had the launch, we decided we would print the covers of the manifesto so people could take something physically away with them about the manifesto. So in the background of this whole event, there was this wonderful swish, swish sound going on of the screen printing in one corner. And in fact, there was another kind of formal House of Commons event going on in the next room. 
And after a while, we noticed that people were coming out of that room and coming into our launch, because our launch was a bit more fun, so we quite liked that. So it was nice to bring craft into that launch. So what we did with the manifesto was we set up five calls for change. Just go past a few pictures. To change the craft ecology around education and training, to build a kind of consensus of opinion, consensus of organisations behind it. So we think creativity and craft needs to be at the heart of education. We need more routes into craft careers. We need to have enterprise there so that people build up skills that they're making skills can then be their job skills and they can actually make money from it and that they can get training and support throughout their careers and also that we need higher education at the heart of research to further what we understand and what we know about craft. So where do we go from here then with this plan of action? We're obviously talking to government, we're talking to ministers, we're now talking to, hoping to talk to new ministers, we're starting again with a new set of responsible people in government and we're looking wider as well to work with the partners that help support us around the manifesto. So there's lots of examples on our website of other organisations who support makers, who support professional development, who support education, who support advocacy work to try and further the ambitions of the manifesto and help redress the balance in the way those figures I showed you earlier are damaging craft education. We're also doing different work ourselves. We've got a number of different projects running in craft education and in training. And things like we run festivals. So, for example, we have a, an annual, sorry, a biannual co conference called Makeshift that's about innovation. And then we run a programme that we've run three times now called Makeshift Do that's working with lots of making centres and educators around the country to have a day or a weekend of events where people can just come along and try something out, like in, in maker spaces. There's more seats down here if you'd like. Um, we also are very keen to support and publicise other activity that's going on. So different education events. And there's different ways in which people benefit from that education. So we ran a programme called Firing Up a few years ago to try and reintroduce ceramics into schools and found that there were some fantastic perceptions both by the teaching staff and the young people of what they gained out of it, how they gained confidence, how they looked afresh at their skills, which was really exciting. And then there's other ways in which people are engaging in craft and some of you may be familiar, aware, uh, familiar as well with craftivism. I know Trade have publicised the work of craftivists and Sarah Corbett, who set up that movement, taking craft into a way of being politically active about particular campaigns and causes. We ourselves at the Crafts Council, we also run some in informal education support. So we host a website for a craft club for working with young people. And last week, Craft Club was talking about up upcycled brushes. So I think there were some guinea pigs in the Crafts Council who had to go and make brushes out of new equipment. Sorry, that's not quite in focus. But there was some information about how Craft Club can support in schools and in, in community centres. Just a simple activity around upcycling materials for making brushes. As a researcher, I've also been interested in different examples internationally of people who research craft in terms of environmental and sustainable values. So there seems to be quite a lot happening in Australia. Queensland University of Technology, Kathleen Horton's done some work on the Stitchery Collective. And this is an artist-run initiative based in Brisbane which seeks to move beyond fashion as a dictum of social class to an alternative model that's accessible, conscious, flexible, connected and sustainable. The project runs community engagement programmes that span design, sewing and upcycling workshops, sustainability lectures, clothing swaps and public education seminars. 
There's also some work done by Binotto and Van Lunn about the Australian fashion label Maison Bris Vegas, which uses second-hand used cotton t-shirts and wool sweaters as primary materials to design fashions that engage a high-profile luxury audience in Australia and internationally. There's also further research, and it may be the research that trade drawn around what prevents people repairing clothes, and it investigates community approaches to sustainable product service systems for clothing repair. So Gwilt describes how within two or three generations, the whole culture of repairing and altering clothes has largely disappeared as the fashion industry has increased the availability of mass-produced, inexpensive clothing. Her figures are that um, a consumer will contribute as much as 30 kilograms of clothing and textile waste to landfill every year, which I find really scary. And she's also looked at the barriers to engagement with repair work, such as regular household activity and lack of technical ability and skill that we all probably recognise in many ways. So we also, at the Crafts Council, like to work with makers, just last few examples for you. Makers who have a sustainable approach to their work and to their resources and materials. So one of the people we love is Lois Walpole, who fuses art, craft and environmentalism. So she's an artist and basket maker who beautifully weaves functional items out of what she calls the detritus of consumerism, as well as using natural materials. And our Hidden Agenda exhibition, currently touring, features um, Lois's work. Or another example is Lieta Marziali, who uses found objects to create her jewellery. Part of a growing trend of makers who use different ob objects, either upcycled or found or recycled, to work with um, new ways to approaching materials. Another example is um, Carmen Hijosa, who we featured recently in a set of cards we produced about craft and inno um, innovation. She's produced a fabric called Pina Tex. Has anyone heard of that? You have? Fantastic, because I think it's a marvellous material. Um, Pina Tex is... And I'm just going to see... Have I got a... No, I haven't got a picture of it. I thought I had. Pina Tex is made from... It's a natural textile, and it's recognised in the fashion industry as a real pioneer in the development of innovative and sustainable materials. Pina Tex partly gives away a bit of the, um, the sourcing of it. Uh, Carmen Hikosa uses the waste byproduct of the pineapple harvest and advanced technologies to create a totally sustainable high performance material. A natural textile that uses no extra land, water, fertilizers, or chemicals in its production. And she's trying to fill the gap between leather and petroleum based textiles and create a good value for money product that companies like Puma are now using and it's now selling as a textile to selected companies from furniture to shoes to accessories. It's a really interesting example. So just to close before opening up a conversation with you, where do we go from here? I'd really be interested in your ideas about where we go given that context of declining craft education. What we're trying to do at the Crafts Council is look very strongly at the role models young people have for craft and creative activity as a career. Not only for young people, but also the people who influence young people. The teachers, the careers advisors, the parents who support career choices. So we're particularly concerned about the advice and guidance and the quality of it and keen to get young people into, <coughs> into opportunities to understand different role models. So we're working with a charity called Inspiring the Future. I'd really recommend a look at their website. They're asking people, not for a great deal, they're asking for an hour a year of people's time to go into schools and to talk about what they do. So I signed up, you sign up by postcode, and two weeks ago I went into a local secondary school to talk to Year 12s, which was absolutely fantastic because particularly when talking about craft and the breadth of the way craft skills are used, whether I was talking to people doing art and design, wanting to do medicine, wanting to do science, there's a way in which those skills can be brought together and those creative skills can be useful. 
So we're trying to look, as I say, at the future of um, the way in which careers education and guidance goes out. We're also setting up a new programme ourselves called Make Your Future. So that's going to be taking ceramics and metalwork and also textiles into school to increase young people's skills. So the textiles strand of that is going to be in Yorkshire. The traditions of the textile industry in Yorkshire we wanted to build on and see how we can strengthen people in that way. So I'd be particularly interested in your ideas. I'm very happy to take any questions on what I've been describing, but also to hear about your experiences and whether they chime in with the findings. So um, thank you very much, and it's over to you. I think seeing um, you know, how we map all of those different pathways and seeing it visually so that you can almost trace a progression of your future and say, you know, what is the pathway available to me if I go into textiles, if I go... I mean, you don't, a lot of the children I come across don't even know what textiles is, what the opportunities are in textiles or art and design and be. So how to visualise that, how to map it, how to then, you know, bring it down into a language that can be shared. And you know, I, I think what you said about having... Um, Advocates, I mean, you're kind of heroes of those worlds, sharing their experience of what they've done to you know, their careers, and then you know that that's the way of everybody going. Oh, the, whoever got this far and they did a. It's really important, isn't it? I think stories are a very good way of bringing it alive for young people, and in fact, creative and cultural skills. The Sector Skills Council that promotes creative careers does have a range of different examples on their website, that's creative and cultural skills, and they do have specific examples of individuals, where they've gone, how they studied, where they went, but it's a very important one. We keep turning more and more to stories to bring those kind of things alive. I think for the, the kind of the grassroots primary, secondary, one of the key things is the kind of teacher recruitment, the drop in teacher recruitment. And that pri primary school, there are no specialists in d &T. They get something like two to four hours actually training in any kind of craft for the whole of their primary secondary training. So you, you're not going in with specialists. And even for um, design and technology specialist teachers, the amount of time that we, I mean, I, I work in teacher training as well as in design. so. The amount of time we have them before they go into school is very limited and they come from a variety of backgrounds. But even so, we're not seeing the amount of students coming because they don't get the bursaries that their maths and science colleagues get. The amount of time that we have them before they go into school is actually really limited. But at primary school level, they get something like two to four hours maximum for their whole primary school training in d &T or arts and crafts. So very few of them are actually specialists yeah. in that area. So if you haven't done that in your own time? Then there isn't that, the there isn't that facility. So I think that's something that the Crafts Council maybe need to think about is how yep. the impact of teacher training and the lack of teachers coming into the system. Yeah, that's really helpful, thank you. The second thing is the word craft. A lot of parents don't understand the difference between craft, design and art. So when you go into school, you're talking about craft as in the industry. But when you look at the curriculum for careers, they're asked to decide between art and design. And also, careers has been taken, careers advisors don't exist in schools anymore. It's all been outsourced. So the careers advice has to come from either the art teacher or through PSHE or from the design teacher. And if those teachers have come through a particular pathway and haven't been out in industry for 10, 15 years, the careers information that they present is dated. So that's another kind of, how do you get the up-to-date information to teachers whose time is already stretched? That's really helpful. Thank um, you. Keep going. <laughs> also, um, in terms of how do you say to students, which, because of the philosophy between design and technology and art and design, while the skill sets might be very similar, 
the philosophy underpinning both of those are slightly a, a different, right. and students trying to then decide which route to go are often decided by when they go on their, their open days to universities, or oh, we don't take anybody that's done d &T, or we don't take anybody that's done art and design, and they actually don't know which route to take because the dialogue that's been sent to them is, a, is, is kind of is too narrow or doesn't give them the, the breadth, the, 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 the width or breadth that they need to actually study, so the, the information coming back is, is varied. Um, and also, when I've spoken to parents about when I've spoken to parents about choices, especially when I've gone, I've been down south and I've been up north. Parents in the kind of the northern regions will say, "Well, I don't want my child to go back into the textile industry because of what happened 20 years ago to the textile textile industry being decimated. We were taken out of jobs, no training was put in. Why would I want to put my child back through that?" So I think there's a big there's a lot of work to be done to address what is a modern textile industry. Yes, I completely agree with that and I think our experience of trying to set up this new programme called Make Your Future and take it to the, the textile areas of the country, the former textile areas, it's really vital that we have that dialogue, dialogue about what is a modern textiles industry. There is still a low take-up of BME students into the arts and crafts and design industry and I think that's something that people have not yet addressed. Why aren't we seeing still, we're still seeing 0.0% or whatever coming through, but if you look at textiles as a subject, it has a gender bias. So if you look at the figures going backwards, even 10, 20 years, 19, I think it's 98.9% .9 take up is girls and 2% is boys. And that's been going on for the last 10, 20 years, but if you look at the other design and technology subjects, it's more or less 50, 50, 60, 40. And I think there needs to be a change about how that subject is actually portrayed to students, to parents, as a subject that everybody can do, rather than it's just, it's a girl subject. So I agree. Thank, you. thank you very much. No, I'd agree with that. With the exception of further education which I think is bucking that trend and has a higher percentage of black and minority ethnic communities than, I think it's slightly higher than the national average. I need to check my figures, but further education is quite interesting in that respect. And also, uh, HNCs and HNDs, we found, were increasing at a higher rate than other areas. The word craft has a number of different associations. And in the data that we're just getting through for our next study that we're publishing in October, we found that there's been a real increase in community education in the over 65 age range in craft skills. So craft in that context probably embraces a wide range of taster things from more traditional crafts through paper crafts through possibly something that's combining craft skills with other areas. So it's quite interesting how different generations, different communities at different points engage with craft. I mean, if you look at some of the markets for craft, we, we try and stimulate the craft market at lots of different levels. We host one um, buying opportunity most years called Collect, that's museum quality pieces of craft and some private buyers and up at that end of the market as well craft is then um, really highly prized as well so there's a kind of real range of different ways in which craft is seen what's what's your experience of craft you, how do you see the word you know you, it was interesting the examples from education as well so one of the teachers wanted a robe embroidered for a piece of the royal academy we got asked to do it so like we'll pay you it's fine and so it's about and I did ecclesiastical like church embroidery for like a year, so I was doing all golf, but it's a quite highly technical, specialised thing. Um, about, between me and my friend, sorry, um, about a good couple of hundred hours work, we paid £50 for the entire work, having made it in entire. So that kind of sense, like, how it's undervalued and how, like, as young creatives, you're, like, scraping any job that you can get, and even when you get that job, it's, like, what, £50 for 200 hours work, which makes it, like, what, four pence an hour, something like that? Like, it's so ridiculous. So it's kind of that sense of, like, even within the art industry, even within higher education, it's still not valued and completely underpaid less than, say, a painter or anything like that. Contemporary art 
all this use of found objects and installations to the point where you don't actually need I think art being a showcase of a maker's skill is very, seems very old school and very traditional and I, I think contemporary art it's more about ideas and concepts so if you're trying to produce provocative cutting edge art yes. by using craft skill the two don't go together so much. It's, it's interesting isn't it almost in terms of fashions because I think that conceptual idea is very much what we associate with art and less so with craft and yet there is a real resurgence in consumers about valuing that personal, that handmade, that story that goes with an object that you buy. Difficult dilemma that. One of the things that I think is shifting slightly is the diversification of routes into creative careers and craft careers because one of the things I didn't mention is that we also looked at figures for apprenticeships. So the numbers of people in apprenticeships have gone up, I think, over since 2007-8 by about 300%. That's still only in the hundreds, those people doing apprenticeships, but nevertheless that is improving. So you can combine <coughs> excuse me, a, a work environment with a learning environment through an apprenticeship. Work-based learning, again, quite small numbers, but that is in, increasing. So I, I think there's a need to look with craft at that diversification that meets both the need to have, a, have some work experience that's not an unpaid internship because people have to survive, that's absurd, but also meets the desire to study without having to rack up those huge fees. So I, I think apprenticeships have a lot to offer and that we need to explore further. I'm also um, curious about what's going to happen in the higher education market are following the EU referendum because some of the figures we've been finding are that figures in numbers in higher education and craft related courses have sort of remained stable. They went up just before tuition fees went up, then they went down again. Figures are roughly stable. Looks like the cohorts going are roughly consistent, but that masks the fact that. The inc there's an increase in non-UK domiciled students of 66%. Now, that means there are more people coming from overseas, which would be fantastic if it wasn't for the fact that the non-EU-based people can only stay in the country now for three or four months after they've finished studying. So we're, we're losing that talent as people are taking it elsewhere because their visas deny them the chance to stay in the country. So what will be interesting to see with the referendum is, well, how does that shift the market in students? Does it? Does it not? But it's, it's an interesting dynamic to watch, to see how student numbers change or maybe how universities have to look at their funding base and their student base. Quite a time of turbulence, really.